Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. Today's topic of interest will be on high blood pressure or healthy blood pressure, maintaining healthy blood pressure. We're going to be discussing the symptoms, the everyday things that you can help uh, to prevent high blood pressure or lower blood pressure. Uh, we'll be discussing also supplementation that can aid lowering blood pressure. Um, the symptoms of blood pressure, um, normally I know when my customers come in the door, sometimes they'll have this tight, slight red face. They'll talk about a little bit of tingling. They'll get headaches. They perspire, um, sometimes profusely. They get fatigued, uh, tired um, all the time, and they're just, just not feeling themselves. Um, the standard um, uh, nomenclature that they use to describe uh, blood pressure is pre-hypertension, stage one, and stage two. Pre-hypertension, by a um, how the medical establishment has diagnosed it or put it at, is anything that's 130 and above or 80 and above on the diastolic. Stage one is 150 to 159 uh, on the uh, systolic and 90 to 99 on the diastolic. And then stage two is anything 160 and above on the systolic and 100 on diastolic. Stage two is kind of a, um, it's where the blood pressure uh, rises so much to where you get concerned whether or not you potentially could have a stroke, a heart attack, or a kidney failure, uh, or literally bursting a vascular system anywhere in the body, especially if the vascular system is, uh, or lacks good integrity to it. Um, 1.5 million Americans have heart attacks every year in the United States alone. Um, obviously, kidney failure, strokes are also related in addition to having heart attacks with the high blood pressure. What high blood pressure means is basically it's, the, it's a measurement that measures through the vascular system the amount of pressure it's taking the body to push the blood through the veins and arteries. Um, we have methods or ways of within our own selves before medications or even supplementation that we need to look at that help prevent and also help control uh, genetic tendencies towards high blood pressure uh, as well as lifestyle uh, issues with blood pressure. D when we examine and look at diet, um, potassium rich diets, potassium and magnesium in today's methods of farming, oftentimes, and the methods of eating and the foods that we're eating, are lacking magnesium and potassium. And these are key minerals that help keep blood pressure down, that relax the vascular system. And without them, you'll get a vasoconstriction, and then the blood pressure rises. So oftentimes, just simple supplementation with potassium-rich foods can be very, very helpful in, uh, with blood pressure. Looking at the sodium and potassium ratios as well, oftentimes people are eating very sodium-rich diets. The potato chips, the soda, so many things that have so sodium in them, canned goods, very high in sodium. So just getting that potassium and sodium ratio back in balance is very critical for keeping blood pressure at a normal level. Certain chemicals. Ibuprofen, which I know a lot of people use for pain, arthritic pain, baking soda or products that have baking soda, particularly baked goods, diet sodas, artificial sweeteners, they all raise blood pressure and these are things that we tend to use in our everyday life. So being aware if you do tend to have a problem with blood pressure to avoid these uh, types of uh, chemicals as much as possible. Increasing your fiber in your diet, getting toxins and things out of the body. Certain, as we noted in here, certain chemicals and toxins will also drive up blood pressure. Pesticides will drive up blood pressure. Any type of chemical that the body sees as being foreign causes inflammation and can cause vasoconstriction, which can raise the blood pressure. So fibers help rem um, remove some of these toxins. They help you eliminate a little bit better, well, actually, a lot bit better, uh, to remove these toxins from the body. 
Uh, eating lots of vegetables, and if you're not diabetic, fruits. Uh, fruits we have to be careful because they do raise blood sugars. But the alkali forms of food, live, wholesome juices. Uh, there's one study on celery, for example, eating four stalks of celery per day. Just four stalks, four ribs of celery, lowered blood pressure an average of 12 to 14 percent. So if you're one of those borderline people or moderate hypertension, just eating celery or juicing celery uh, or celery juices along with greens can help lower your blood pressure and bring it back within normal range. Something so simple. And since Americans don't tend to eat their usual three to five servings of vegetables a day, you can see why maybe the contributing factor on the lack of minerals and the lack of vegetables that help reduce inflammation, keep the fiber levels up, help with keep the blood pressure down. Um, eating good fats in the diet, uh, things like walnuts, almonds, pecans, fish, avocados, all those things help reduce um, inflammation in the vascular system and they do slightly keep the blood a little bit thinner. They keep it from clotting so readily. They keep it smoother. It keeps the vascular system smoother so you don't, know, don't end up with these buildups and these clots that can tend to raise blood pressure as well. Um, when we look at meat consumption and I know there is a higher segment of the population now that are becoming more and more vegetarians, but Eating particularly high-fat meats raise a marker called a homocysteine level. And that homocysteine level that physicians can test you for is a marker that can tend to indicate whether or not you're higher risk for having uh, strokes, blood clots, that type of thing. So if you do eat meat, eat leaner pieces of meat, uh, you know, your fish, your leaner portions of your chicken, your lean beef if you're going to eat beef. So, you know, animal sources of protein are a part of our society and most of our diets, but once again, lean cuts. Um, just something to be aware of, too. Um, Mayo inhibitors, which are um, oftentimes uh, mostly utilized for depression and for blood pressure as well, and then other things. There are certain types of foods that you eat or that you can eat with these Mayo inhibitors that can raise blood pressure. I mean things like almonds, uh, certain types of liver, cheeses, very common uh, types of foods that will raise blood pressure if you're taking these Mayo inhibitors. So if you are on an antidepressant or on a Mayo inhibitor for whatever purpose, you need to look up online or hopefully there's something on the warnings on your medications that indicate these tramamine, uh, or tramine rich foods that can raise blood pressure being aware because if all of a sudden you're on a Mayo inhibitor and my blood pressure goes up, why is that? You need to look at the diet because foods in their own way are medicines as well and they can affect uh, their chemical reactions in the body and they can affect the blood pressure. Exercise. There's a lot of studies out there that support just 30 minutes a day of good exercise and it doesn't have to even be extremely vigorous. And just good, a good walking the dog, lifting some weights, some Pilates, something that gets the heart and the blood flowing and moving. Because what that does is it gets the vascular system exercised. Okay? So when you exercise, blood starts pumping, it exercises and keeps the vascular system, the heart, the brain, other things in very good working order. So exercise is very important for keeping blood pressure as well as blood sugars down as we've discussed in, in, uh, in other shows. Sleep. The lack of sleep can drive up blood pressure, but also keep in mind if you do have high blood pressure, it is readily indicated and you tend to have sleep issues or snoring issues. Um, it is now indicated um, by most good physicians that you uh, go through a sleep diagnostic test ch to check for sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea um, robs the body of oxygen and therefore raises the blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure and you tend to snore or, or your wife or your husband tells you you snore, it may not be a bad idea to get checked uh, for potential sleep disturbances as being a contributing factor to your blood pressure. Drugs that can raise blood pressure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Diuretics, and there are high blood pressure medications that are diuretics. 
So being aware that diuretics deplete potassium and magnesium levels, and as we discussed earlier, potassium and magnesium is vital to keep blood pressure down, these diuretics can raise the blood pressure. So being aware of that, you need to make sure that you either supplement with potassium and magnesium or eat very, very uh, potassium-rich foods. Most of our foods nowadays don't contain proper amounts of magnesium, so it's very, very difficult to get ample amounts of magnesium without supplementation anymore. They, re they estimate about 92% of Americans are magnesium deficient. And magnesium, and not just with blood pressure, it helps with bowel movement, it helps you sleep, it rests, it helps with anxiety. So being aware of that, those diuretics can rob the body of those really, really important mem um, minerals. Allergy and cold medications. Antihistamines. Allergy seasons, you're on a high blood pressure medication, you're on an antihistamine, pew, there goes the blood pressure. So finding alternatives, homeopathics or naturopathic methods of working with allergies. And then wa watching your, your blood sugar levels because those can tend to trigger allergies even more. So being aware that these cold and allergy medications, they raise the blood pressure or they can raise the blood pressure. I found some very interesting statistics that I think are pretty important to be addressed that I think the public needs to be very, very aware of. Um, I handled medical malpractice cases in, in a past career. Um, I was a mediator for insurance companies, and I would defend doctors, and I would go in and mediate cases. Um, when we're looking at when it is time to have or utilize a blood pressure medication, I look to the experts, and the American Journal of Cardiology, which is what we call the uh, expert medical journal in cardiology, six separate studies indicated and showed that drug therapy for high blood pressure benefited, provided no benefit in borderline to moderate high blood pressure. No benefit. So those people that are um, under that 160, no benefit, according to the American Journal of Cardiology. In the Journal of American Medical, uh, JAMA is what it's known, um, treatment of hypertension is one of the leading uh, reasons why people go to the doctor, okay? So when you look at, you have all these wonderful visits for hypertension, most of which are below 160, it generates a lot of income uh, for uh, physicians. It generates income for pharmaceutical companies. So looking at our own medical journal recommendations, and using our logic skills tells us that, hey, if we can find something else to bring that blood pressure down when we see no benefit in border to uh, moderate high blood pressure, I think that's a better option considering the side effects that go along with these medications. Um, impotence, dizziness, weakness, weight gain, the list goes on. So before you consider a high blood pre pressure medication, you need to look at your options. Discuss, your doc discuss it with your doctor or your healthcare professional. And remember this data and this information, okay? Don't just ignore it. That's not my purpose or what I would suggest under any circumstances. It shouldn't be ignored if it begins to be pre-hypertensive uh, or stage one. And surely don't ignore it if it's stage two. But there are other ways that you can lower blood pressure without the side effects of medications under the supervision of your doctor, some of which we've already mentioned. There are supplements that can be, um, that are very well researched, most of which, actually all of which are backed by studies either here in the States, Japan, Europe, and other countries that we would consider of equal quality in double-blind placebo medical studies. Uh, magnesium we've discussed earlier. Uh, 6 to 12 grams of magnesium per 2.2 pounds of body weight. So if you've got a 150-pound person, you're going to need uh, probably right between 4 and 600 milligrams of magnesium to help keep that blood pressure down. Magnesium in other countries, when people have heart attacks, and in some places here in the States, magne magnesium is utilized when you get someone coming in having a heart attack because magnesium is a vasorelaxer. 
So in an emergency, they'll give an infusion of magnesium, brings the blood pressure down, rather than using the drugs or medications. Options. My, what I seek to do here is to give you options to discuss with your healthcare professional. Okay? Vitamin C increases vascular flexibility. Vitamin C deficiency, you get hardening of the arteries. When the arteries harden, the blood pressure goes up. So the vitamin C with bioflavonoids keeps the vascular system very flexible, flexible and very pliable. Um, a multivitamin, high in B vitamins and antioxidants, helps with vascular health and vascular repair. We know that uh, folic acid studies, uh, trimethylglycine studies, B vitamins help maintain vascular integrity. Fish oils, flax oil, we talked about some of the foods that can help uh, with keeping inflammation down, uh, increasing circulation. With fish and flax oil, there's over 60 studies, 60 studies that support it lowering of blood pressure. And in the customers that I see coming in the door, the range I see in lowering blood pressure is between 10 and some 40 points with just fish oils and magnesium combinations and keeping a potassium-rich diet. So vitamin E lessens the chances of a heart attack by at least 40%. In diabetics and some other studies, it was even higher than that because vitamin E helps reduce clotting and it slightly thins the blood. Lecithin is a fat emulsifier. It goes in the vascular system. It picks up all those cholesterol buildups, that fat triglyceride stuff. It removes it out of the body, gets it gone, lowering the blood pressure. Garlic and onions, either in supplementation form or in eating. Um, the studies that I uh, saw ranged in a 5 to 10% reduction in blood pressure. See, this list is just going on and on of options that you have that you can discuss with your health care professional. Um, greens, Coriella, spinach, anything that's green, alkalize the blood. Um, we don't know exactly oftentimes the action of like products like Coriella, which is a superfood green that comes from the ocean. And then there's blue-green algae, which is um, from regular water, um, non-salt water. Um, lowers blood pressure. Um, I have people coming in to my store reporting anywhere from 15 to 20 uh, points drop. Uh, in their blood pressure um, just by adding some additional Coriella. Hawthorne increases left ventricle output, so it helps the heart push out the blood a little bit better, lowering blood pressure. CoQ10, most 39% of people who have high blood pressure are CoQ10 deficient. So, study, four to, 10, or four to 12 weeks, showed a lowering of blood pressure by 10%. L-arginine, an amino acid, um, actually used for um, a male circulation as well, um, increases nitric oxide, relaxes the vascular system, lowers the blood pressure. Grapeseed, pycnogenol, lycomato, L-carnitine, these are all supplements that showed at least a 10% reduction in double-blind placebo studies. And these double-blind placebo studies, most of which are performed by universities not pharmaceutical-backed research. When you look for your research, we want to look to university studies, independent studies, National Health Institute studies, not pharmaceutical studies. We don't want biased, we want independent research. Natokinase, to conclude, this particular product um, was found to be more effective than any other anticoagulant drug on the market when utilized in Japanese hospitals. Mind you, I say Japanese hospitals, not, not, not United States. What natokinase does is it eats fibrin. It prevents fibrin buildup. It breaks up blood clots uh, that form. And these embolisms, they go to the lungs and the heart, and you end up with heart attack, stroke, uh, kidney failure. So a simple product from food called natto, and we ourselves from ingesting various foods have natto kinase, but most of our foods don't uh, tend to be natto rich, um, showed a 10% reduction in blood pressure, dilation of the blood vessels, and a breakdown of these um, uh, clotting factors or these clots that can contribute uh, to heart attack and stroke and kidney failure. I hope this gives you some uh, information in which you can uh, do some additional research and have discussions with your healthcare professional. Next, we'd like to move on to our fitness portion of the show. Hi, welcome.
welcome to the fitness portion of our show. Today I'd like to show you a couple of stretches that I think could be helpful either um, uh, prior to starting exercise, once the body is warmed up. You never want to stretch the body without it being warmed up. So a few minutes uh, of, of running, uh, jogging, something, calisthenics, to warm the body up before stretching. And then stretching after um, a workout is always a really good idea as well. And then plus two, when we get those, uh, or those who do get, uh, quadricep or hamstring cramps. I hope that maybe this stretch may help with some of that cramping as well. First I'd like to so show you a quadricep stretch and that's the um, section of muscle right in the front here. And what we do is we gently pull up and we don't go like this or this, this. We just gently pull up and we put a little bit of pressure pulling our heel towards our buttocks just to give a nice little stretch, not an overstretch, uh, to the uh, quadricep. Okay, and holding it probably for 15 to 30 seconds and then releasing it. The next stretch I'd like to show you is for hamstrings and then for the back of the calves as well. What you do is you angle your foot upward in that kind of motion and then you slightly bend over to get a good full stretch on the back of that hamstring, the buttocks, you can feel it on your calf, holding it for about 15 to 30 seconds. I hope that will be helpful for you. Next we're going to be moving on to our research analyst, Ralph Turciano. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And Ralph Turciano will be giving us the latest, greatest research available within the last 30 days. Ralph? Hi, and thank you for the intro. Yeah, recently Tufts University researchers did a small study on the vitamin B6 content of blood levels of about 7,800 people. What they discovered was basically that at least 25% of those individuals were severely deficient in the vitamin B6. Ironically, 11% of those were even supplement users. However, even more disconcerting was this. Among women using contraceptives, that were not taking in a multivitamin, 75% were severely deficient in B6. What that means is this. Well, as you may say, what does B6 mean to me? Well, some signs of deficiency of B6 are this. Impaired antibody production, lowered immunity, anemia, nerve damage, vascular dam damage, dandruff, eczema, psoriasis, mouth sores, depression, and anxiety, especially since B6 is responsible or partly responsible for the production of serotonin and dopamine. So it plays kind of a huge role in quite a, quite a number of functions. However, according to the National Institute of Health, after reviewing the study, came out to say vitamin B6 deficiencies in the United States are rare, countering the researchers from Tufts University, which also said too, that the two milligrams per day of B6, by the way, everyone in the study was getting the RDA of B6, was still showing deficiency and they're recommending raising it to six milligrams, at least three times what the government is recommending. After that, there was some benefit to growing up on the farm. In fact, this may explain a lot as we move from our agricultural society to an industrial society. They discovered pregnant women who spent a little bit of time on the farm, had children, which had greatly reduced number of allergies. They found that the living on the farm, even for a short period of time, in their words, act to suppress immune responses and thereby maintain immune system balance to contribute to a healthy immune development. And the effect was strongest among those mothers who entered barns or drank farm milk. Keep in mind, that was non-pasteurized, non-homogenized raw milk is what they meant by farm milk. But pretty interesting. After that, going back, a few researchers tried to figure out why some of these incense we use during religious ceremonies actually help balance out the mood. Well, one of them, especially from John Hopkins and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, discovered that burning frankincense, or boswellin, in their words, activates poorly understood ion channels in the brain to alleviate anxiety or depression. 
According to them, though, this suggests a whole new class of depression and anxiety drugs may be right under our noses. Obviously, if you can just go out and buy frankincense, you know, use it yourself, it may not be a bad option to try before using other more drastic measures. In fact, in the study, they pointed out that 40 million Americans to this day suffer from anxiety-related disorders. In my opinion, they should start making car fresheners out of frankincense to help with the gas pump problems. Four dollars a gallon. All right. After that, UCSD researchers show a link between vitamin D status and breast cancer. You cannot hear enough about vitamin D. They found out this was the first global study. It looked at everybody. It took into account diet, the whole lineup. They found out that people with the highest vitamin D levels had the lowest breast cancer rates. They're trying to draw a direct, direct connection. But also at the same time, too, they're bringing out the sun was important more than anything else. Reiterating an old story from 2004, which after 30 years of research and over 200 peer-reviewed journal studies, especially with the Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of American Medical Association, there was a researcher called Dr. Mike Hollock, a professor in medicine, physiology, biophysics at the Boston University School of Medicine, was challenging the fact for years that we use sunscreen and a fear of the sun too much. He says, there's important medical consequences of this continuing rhetorical campaign of fear and exaggerated claims. There is no doubt vitamin D is the best way for the body to control abnormal cell growth. In his words, he says this, as far as the vitamin D and the sun, primarily is generally that skin cancer in the worst case may kill 1,200 people per year. But vitamin D deficiency and the cancers caused by it, they says a minimum of 150,000 deaths per year. Now going on to the industrial medicine side. More than half of insured Americans now are in chronic medicines. Give me a few statistics. One in four children and teenagers is now taking a prescription drug for a chronic condition. 52% of adult men are on prescription drugs for a chronic condition. 75% of those 65 or older Two-thirds of women just 20 years or older are now on prescription drugs, not birth control pills, prescription drugs for chronic health conditions. So in this case, you have to decide why. Is it poor personal responsibility? Just eat till you get a gastric bypass? Is it environmental factors? Enough estrogen in our fire farms to add 10 pounds of weight? Or is it medical bullying, which is a new trend I'm disturbed by? My new favorite fear tactic, I should say. Take this drug or you're going to die a slow, horrible death. You have to decide. But it's not going to be a brave new world which we see, where everyone takes a medicine to be happy and healthy. It's turning to a world where we're de-evolving ourselves from physical independence and creating a new evolution of chemical dependency. You decide. Wow. Thank you very much, Ralph, for your information. Once again, we hope that this uh, show helps encourage you to do further research into its topics. Thank you very much.